Well, I'm not going to talk about God in the brain because we already went over that yesterday. But um, I'd like to make a few comments about some of the other topics that were covered uh, in the last few days. Um, one of them was the, the talk given by uh, Mazaran Banaji, which I enjoyed immensely. In fact, one of the highlights of the conference. And um, I think work is brilliant. It's precisely the sort of thing that needs to be done in the social sciences. But I would like to disagree minor quibbles I have with some of the points she made. And it, it's too bad she's not here to uh, defend herself. Um, and again, it doesn't detract from the main points she made. But let's, what she's really studying is cognitive illusions. Something uh, like, for example, the statistical biases in certain directions. You could call them cognitive illusions. Uh, very similar to what I do with visual illusions. I mean, here is a departure from reality. You see something that isn't, that isn't true. Uh, but when you study visual illusions, you want to ask, why does it happen? And typically, there's a hidden agenda. It's telling you, revealing something about how the brain works, how the visual system works. And that mechanism, which you can figure out by using visual illusions as a probe, in this particular case, is misapplied. You're misapplying that algorithm. So you're using those illusions as a probe to understand what the algorithms are. Now, in social psychology, often this is not done, and that's why Mazarin's talk is an exception, uh, where she was trying to account for these statistical biases, such as women are cooks, or um, African Americans are uh, I mean, involved in mugging and things like that. But there is a difference, and, and this is what worries me, and that is, in the case of the example of cooks and women, I don't want to step on any toes here, you see the brain is essentially a statistical machine. It's a, it's a Bayesian machine. It's looking for correlations all the time. And this is well known. And in fact, in the real world, it's often the case that women are cooks. You learn it from hearsay. You learn it from watching, especially if you're from India. And that's why the brain has learned this. Now, of course, you're going to deny it. If somebody asks you, do, do you believe that women's, only women should cook, you know it's politically incorrect to say this. You'll say, of course not. But you, you might be morally outraged by this. So this dissociation between what your statistical machine, the cognitive mechanism is doing, versus your intellectual judgment of whether it should be. In other words, the shock value of this result comes from the fact that there's a political aspect to it, namely women should not be associated with cooking, versus the cognitive illusion aspect of it, where they do associate women with cooking. But there's no real paradox is what I'm saying. Another example, Stuart Anst is a colleague of mine. We're walking on the road the other day. It was a little, little bit dark, walking on the pavement. We heard footsteps behind us, and we looked behind, and there was an African-American gentleman. And suddenly, we started walking faster. And then I looked at Stuart, and I said, this is absurd. You know, this Holt Institute. And had it been a white Caucasian person, we wouldn't have done that. It occurred to both of us. Now, that's because your brain has a statistical bias, because it is indeed true you're more likely to be mugged if it's, a, if it's an African American. I don't know if this is still true, but until 10 years ago, it was true. So this bias is picked up by the statistical machines in your brain. On the other hand, if you ask me or Stuart, hey, do you believe that they're, that, you know, they're more capable of mugging and violence than Caucasian white male? You say, of course not, because that's political correctness. That's your cortex kicking in and it's going to say it's not true. Um, I think what would be much more interesting is the converse. If you show that the brain has a statistical machine has picked up certain truths about the world, not absolute truths, but certain truths about the world, and then a cognitive belief you implant in the person, which is clearly absurd, takes over. This would be an example of, of what, an example of a meme, a pernicious meme. You can ask empirical questions and do experiments on memes. In other words, all the empirical evidence is telling you the opposite, and yet one implanted belief by a, by a prophet or by some guru is, overrides all the statistical information. And that, to me, would be an extremely interesting result. In other words, the exact converse of, of uh, Mazarin Banerjee's result. And of course, that, that sort of thing does happen occasionally. And I can give you several examples, but we don't have time to go into that. The second point I want to make is about, completely unrelated, about the anthropic principle. And I wish Paul Davies were, were here to discuss this. And as you all know, the anthropic principle is how come all the constants, physical constants in the world, are so precisely chosen, chosen in quotes, to make the Earth possible, to make human beings possible, right? And, and so on and so forth. And one answer is that there's nothing impossible about all this. It's only highly improbable, right? Another answer is the multiverse hypothesis, which I don't find very convincing. But it's another possible. You were only, only through natural selection, the one universe which had all the constants being correct, I'm here to talk about it. But I like to use an analogy 
with another form of the anthropic principle, which is you could regard as an even stronger version, or you could say you can use it to debunk or caricature the anthropic principle. And that is the problem of individual human existence, right? I am here, this is extremely improbable, vanishingly small. Because if my father, when he was having intercourse with my mother, had coughed, right? So a different sperm had fertilized the egg. I wouldn't be here. My brother would be here talking, if that, right? Not only that, if my father's father had coughed, then my father wouldn't have been here and I wouldn't have been here. And so on and so forth, go all the way back to Homo, one particular Homo habilis, or Homo habilis, had not made love to that appropriate female Homo habilis, I wouldn't be here giving this talk. Now, it's very similar to the anthropic principle, except there you're invoking particular types of laws and the exact fact, fact that the laws have to be exactly right. Here you're talking about a particular sequence of contingencies, which if they had not been exactly right, I wouldn't be here. So here's an example of Another anthropic principle, as I said, you can either use it to strengthen the argument or you could use it to caricature and debunk the argument. I'm sort of agnostic right, on this point. The third point that was raised yesterday was about prophets in science and prophets in, um, versus prophets in religion. And I think it's naughty to compare these two things. In, actually, Joan and I found ourselves more in agreement than we had realized. We started out saying we we're clashing, but in fact, we, were, we are, or I think we are, converging to the same point. The difference is that a prophet in science, of course, science has its delusional cul-de-sacs, people rewarding each other, funding each other, giving each other medals, refereeing each other's papers. All of this happens in science. There are prejudices. There's what Kuhn calls normal science, which essentially is a system of delusions. And then there's an anomaly that topples the edifice, and you start from scratch. But the point is, there is a correction mechanism. You know, when an anomaly comes in, you throw away the previous, or you modify what you had previously. And uh, this does not happen. So for example, if I bring, uh, bring you a triple helix extra crystallography, saying double helix model is wrong, I can explain all the findings, but in fact, this is the correct model. It explains even more. Right? There may be tremendous resistance to this for five years, for 10 years, 15 years. But if the evidence starts coming in and it's replicated, you say, Crick is no longer the prophet. He's wrong. Throw it away. I still respect him. I still, he's one of my heroes, but he's wrong. And I, by the way, I think he's wrong about consciousness, but I'll get to that later. Okay. So I would say that he's wrong about that. So in that sense, there are no prophets. But if I were to say the same thing about, about Islam, and if I say, by definition, a religious prophet cannot be proved wrong. Because if he says, there's 50 virgins up there when, when, when you die, and you do the right thing, I cannot disprove it using the empirical methods of science. This is true of Hinduism, it's true of Christianity, it's true of all religions, not just of Islam. I just pulled that out of the hat, right? So the dogmas of, of, of religious prophets cannot be disproved, cannot ever be disproved. To compare that with the kinds of dogmas we have in science is mischievous, I think, okay? Um, but having said that, let, I, I would consent that there are dogmas in science which become untestable, to use the pauper's term. Uh, not in principle unt untestable, fortunately, but essentially in the practice of science become untestable. And I'm going to shock everybody by saying natural selection is one such example. I strongly believe that natural selection is the most important principle. Maybe it's, it's the only principle, but certainly one of the most important principles of evolution, right? There is no intelligent design. There's nothing supernatural. There's no other influence. So it's Darwinian natural selection. But the other day I was reading a zoology textbook and it said there's a creature called Fernizona, a desert lizard. And if it sees a predator about five feet away, it squirts blood into the face of the predator to scare it away. And then I said, my God, what possible intermediate sequence could have resulted in this? Some, some, some desert lizard had a little squirt of blood and then more squirt of blood and then it, it didn't make any sense. Now the standard example of what good is 1% of an eye is a bad example. As Richard has pointed out, 1% of eyes is, is, is very important and can be very helpful. And all you need is a tiny little uh, uh, bias in evolution that will get, get the whole cascade going. But there are, I, Fernizoma is one example, but I can give you dozens of examples, Remora or hundreds of examples. And the standard explanation for this, you, to use Popper's thing, Popper's raise Popper again, is well, if you give enough time and if you give enough pre adaptation, I can explain it. It doesn't matter. So we don't need to know the details of how it evolved. Okay? Of course it must have evolved. And of course this is true because, for example, whales 
the gap between whales and land, land living animals was enormous. People couldn't figure out how it happened until people found fossils with four whales with four legs and then whales with two legs and then whales with just the pelvis. And clearly the sequence became apparent. That may well happen for Remora, it may happen for Fernosoma. But what I'm saying is by saying, what would it take for me, what would I have to show you for you to then say, hey, natural selection doesn't account for everything. Supposing I bring a creature with a kettle attached to his chest, which I just dredged up in the Galapagos. And you say, well, it's not surprising because, you know, given millions and millions of years, given enough time, given the selection process, you can get a kettle stuck on the head, right? So if you start saying that, it becomes an untestable proposition. But more importantly, it removes the incentive to look for other biological mechanisms that could lead to evolution. So without denying the reality of natural selection, right, or the importance of natural selection, Darwin himself recognized this as a principle called sexual selection, which again doesn't contradict natural selection, but is an additional principle he invoked. So by saying everything can be explained completely by natural selection, there are no other mechanisms of evolution, there's a danger of getting into a, uh, essentially an untestable proposition. And I'll give you another example. I think brain mechanisms can aid evolution. So for example, we know seagull chicks go for a beak. Normally the beak has one red spot on it. But if you have a beak with three red stripes, as Timbergen showed, the chick goes crazy. Now we don't know why, but it's something to do with idiosyncrasies of the wiring of the chick's visual system. That's why it goes crazy. Now I predict the emergence of a future race of seagulls in the next 10,000, 100,000 million years with, with mothers with striped beaks, right? So this came out of the understanding of a principle of hypernormal stimuli. Technically, it's not even a hypernormal stimulus because it's not a bigger beak or more beak-like. It's stripy beak, which doesn't even resemble a beak with a spot. There's another principle which has something to do with the idiosyncrasies of the wiring of the chick's brain. So that's an example of how you can bring another principle to bear, but it, you, may, you may not have the incentive to do so if you say, well, it's all explained by the, the hill climbing process of natural selection. So I did want to make a point about uh, personal and impersonal God, uh, but I think we'll stop there.